On the night of March 13, 1997, thousands of people gathered outside their homes in Phoenix to watch the Hale-Bob comet gracefully pass through the night sky. The air was calm as the warmth of the day surrendered to the cooling embrace of twilight. At around 8 p.m., people started noticing there was something else in the clear, dry skies of the desert, something they had never seen before, something otherworldly. tucked away suburban street, Tim Lay and his young son Hal have returned home from visiting friends. The Lay family usually eat by 8 p.m., so they are running a tad late. Tim pulls the car into the drive and gets out to open the door for his son. Tim looks through the glass and notices Hal is looking straight past him, staring into the night sky. Tim turns and sees a colossal object gliding towards their home. The object is completely quiet. The silence is only broken by the sound of front doors closing and chatter as people enter the streets. A couple of miles away, emergency response calls start pouring in. 911, what's the emergency, please? Hello, sir. I live on Edgewood Avenue and there is this huge thing in the sky. I think you need to send someone out here. The National UFO Reporting Center was also being flooded by calls, many of whom were police officers, air traffic controllers, and pilots. In a private home in Paradise Valley, a group of hospice volunteers are sitting outside for their monthly meeting. Terry Mansfield is in a state of peace, providing care is a true passion for her. The smell of orange blossoms prevail in the cool spring air, and the group are having an enthusiastic discussion. One of the volunteers' eyes drift upward toward the sky. Oh my God. When the others look up, they see an enormous object gliding right overhead. It looks like some kind of undulating black fabric blocking out the stars. It's so large, they cannot see the edges. There's no sound, wind, or heat. For what feels like eternity, the group watch as the mile-long craft keeps going and going, and going. Alarmingly, this account is just one of many. One witness, a truck driver named Bill Greiner, was traveling south on Interstate 17 from Verda Valley to a gravel plant just a mile from Luke Air Force Base. He claims to have seen two glowing objects flying around overhead as jets were scrambled to intercept them. Mr. Greiner says the jets approached the objects and they shot directly upwards and vanished in an instant. Luke Air Force Base responded to the claim saying no jets were in use after 7 p.m. on March 13th. Bill Greiner has maintained his story and stated publicly he knows what he saw and would take a lie detector test. Another man, Terry Proctor, filmed the event. The footage shows five lights in a V formation sit completely stationary in the skies above Phoenix. Channel 15 local news reported that this object crossed the approach and departure flight path of Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. They claim a pilot called Tower Controllers to report a series of five lights moving in formation above his plane. The FAA has never released any radar or communications from March 13, 1997. Some air traffic controllers have stated that there was no reading on the object, but they could clearly see it with the naked eye. Herb Moran, a pilot and an aviation industry worker, claimed he also seen strange lights six days earlier in the area on March 7th. He said this sighting was close to the Palo Verde nuclear plant. These claims were criticized until the wife of Scott Montgomery handed video footage he had taken of the lights over to Channel 10 News. Hollywood actor Kurt Russell was flying a private plane near the airport when the object breached his flight area. He contacted air traffic control and officially reported the incident. Dr. Lynn Kitai films the event from her home and the footage is truly stunning. Dr. Katai lives on a ridge that overlooks the city. Her film shows a mammoth object eerily stalk the skyline of Phoenix.
Well, whether you're a skeptic or you're a believer, there is no doubting that there was indeed something in the sky. This event had thousands of witnesses. Most accounts describe the same set of lights connected by a triangular craft. One of the hardest things to explain here is that this object was truly giant, many estimates being as big as a mile wide. What sets the Phoenix lights apart from other sightings is the sheer number of witnesses, the amount of film and photographic evidence, and the duration. Unbelievably, reports from the public and law enforcement come in for 12 hours and span four states. The calls show that the object headed in a southeasterly direction, corroborating eyewitness testimony and the timeline of events. So, what could this possibly be? The U.S. Air Force were initially silent on the matter, but after so much public unrest, they did release a statement. First, they said the Phoenix lights were flares dropped by A-10 warthogs during a training exercise. Then they said they were a group of A-10 warthogs flying in formation, training pilots in the flight path of the busiest airport in Arizona. I'll let you be the judge of that. Witnesses were outraged at the response, and it was rejected by the people of Phoenix. Frances Barwood is a former vice mayor and councilwoman of Phoenix. Three months after the incident on May 6th, she attends a city council meeting and makes a comment that there are reporters outside wanting answers about the event. She then kindly asks, What the hell was that thing? The room falls silent. She gets no response. After the meeting, she is approached by one of the city managers. He tells her she should not have asked that question. When Frances asks why, she is told the mayor's office don't want to talk about this. They released a statement and they don't want any more questions about it, so back off. Frances is alarmed by this. She believes this object posed a risk not only to civilians, but also to the arriving planes at Sky Harbor Airport. She continues to search for answers and sends a letter to Senator John McCain. Immediately after this, she starts being attacked by mainstream newspapers. Front page illustrations of Frances wearing tin foil hats. Images of her with aliens and derogatory jokes start appearing everywhere. She is publicly disgraced and her career ruined. Who was behind such an attack? Why would a respected councilwoman asking legitimate questions be treated this way? It has been long acknowledged that government agencies and the media work together. Is this what happened here? Funnily enough, there was a positive side to the assault on Francis. Researchers estimate around 10,000 civilians seen the event on March 13th. Her office begins to be inundated with calls from the public. Maybe the people of Phoenix feel they can trust her. Over the next few months, the councilwoman's office has several thousand messages to tend to. She personally speaks to 700 of these people and states that 699 of them had the exact same story. These witnesses included active military, retired military, police officers, firefighters, and entire Little League teams. Frances Barwood found a new career. She continues to search for answers to this day. Interestingly, five days after the sightings, the governor of Arizona, Fife Symington, made a statement to the public. He said his office was taking the event very seriously, and they would be gathering information from relevant authorities like the military. He assured the people he was committed to getting answers. To be honest, I personally believe he was sincere at this time, but something changed. On June 19th, 1997, the governor walks out to the podium. The room is filled with media and representatives from his office. The people of Phoenix watch on from home eagerly as the much awaited press conference begins. Finally, they will get some clarity on what has shaken the lives of thousands in the area. He puts his mouth to the microphone, straight-faced, and tells the cameras they know what happened on the night of March 13th. He then orders Officer Stein to bring out the accused. A group of law enforcement officers walk onto the stage with a man dressed in an alien costume. After Fife Symington made an earnest commitment to investigate the incident, he made a complete mockery of the whole situation. Wow, I 
can only imagine the frustration of the witnesses. So many trained and credible people just embarrassed and ridiculed publicly. People who are tasked with protecting the city. Doctors. Pilots. Law enforcement. Well, if it's any constellation, years later, Governor Fife Symington would go on the record and say he actually seen the craft himself. This is why I believe his first statements were genuine. Obviously something happened between March 18th and June 19th that compelled him to do this. So, where does this leave us? In this episode we focused on the city of Phoenix, but, like I said earlier, this object was seen in multiple states. Sightings started in Nevada, crossed over Arizona, New Mexico, and finally Mexico where reports ceased. Now, obviously if there were reports made in Mexico they wouldn't be received by any American bodies and we will probably never know. What we do know is, there was a very large object that traveled in a southeasterly direction moving very slowly and even hovering at times. We know multiple witnesses captured the craft on camera, and after 25 years no one can explain what this object is. Jim DeLatoso, the founder of the Arizona State University Computer Institute and NASA Technology Director analyzed the footage. He used histogram graphs to study the light in multiple pieces of footage and ruled out flares, planes, and any prosaic explanation. Jim made the statement, quote, This was an extraterrestrial spacecraft. We know that there were similar objects filmed above Phoenix in 1995, and again six days prior to March 13th. In 2005, a military witness went on the record and claimed he was the ground crewman that prepared the jets that were scrambled from Luke Air Force Base. He states that when they returned, he had to help one of the pilots out of his jet because he was so shaken up. Quote, One of the pilots stated he had a visual. They've got gun camera footage of it. They had no radar. It scared the hell out of them. This gave credibility to reports made by truck driver Bill Greiner. However, Luke Air Force Base continued to deny there was a response. Well, look guys, in my opinion the response from the government was not only insufficient, but it was completely ridiculous. In the year 2000 the Air Force doubled down, but the flares hypothesis has been ruled out by experts. Flares cannot stay aloft for 12 hours and travel 250 miles horizontally. In one of her early appeals, Francis Barwood suggested that if the Air Force were responsible, simply reenact the event. Additionally, it has been confirmed that they lied about the jets being scrambled from Luke Air Force Base, so it begs the question why? With so much concern and public distrust, why wouldn't there be more investigation? It's as if the film recordings were just ignored as evidence. Not only were thousands of people told they were mistaken on what they saw, they were also criticized and belittled. Well, I gotta say, it does seem like there was an intentional effort to smear anyone asking questions. Why would the governor pull that press conference stunt when he himself seen the craft? In recent years, he has done multiple interviews where he talks about what he saw that night. Here I will read statements made in 2007. In 1997, during my second term as governor of Arizona, I saw something that defied logic and challenged my reality. I witnessed a massive delta-shaped craft silently navigate over Squaw Peak. It was truly breathtaking. It was dramatically large and had a very distinctive leading edge with enormous lights. I will never forget it. I remember I had to sneak out because I'm not supposed to drive my own car. I told my wife Anne what I was doing. I had heard there was something happening in the sky and wanted to check it out. When I returned she said I was as white as a ghost. I told her what happened. I knew I wouldn't be able to talk about it. As a pilot and a former Air Force officer, I can definitively say that this craft did not resemble any man-made object I'd ever seen. And it was certainly not high-altitude flares. My office did make inquiries as to the origin of the craft, but to this day they remain unanswered. I now know that I am not alone. There are many high-ranking military, aviation, and government officials who share my concerns. While on active duty, they have either witnessed a UFO incident or have conducted an official investigation into UFO cases relevant to aviation safety and national security. By speaking out with me, these people are putting their reputations on the line. They have fought in wars, guarded top-secret weapons arsenals, and protected our nation's skies. 
We want the government to stop putting out stories that perpetuate the myth that all UFOs can be explained away in down-to-earth conventional terms. Investigations need to be reopened, documents need to be unsealed, and the idea of an open dialogue can no longer be shunned. Incidents like these are not going away. What I saw in the Arizona sky goes beyond conventional explanations. When it comes to events of this nature that are still completely unsolved, we deserve more openness in government, especially our own. Farley Nanman is a veteran 911 call operator in Phoenix. She made this statement in 2005. We had hundreds of calls, everyone was saying the same thing. You could tell they weren't on drugs or drunk, they weren't kooks. They were legitimate people calling. We just couldn't believe it. Nothing like this has ever happened. I had worked there for 25 years, never had calls like this. We were swamped with the same calls about this thing in the sky. There was about 15 of us getting the same thing and we just didn't know what to say. This had never happened before and we're not trained in asking UFO questions so we just tried to reassure them we are doing what we can. A couple of days later I was checking the newspaper. I wanted to see if there was any information about what happened. I see this article where a police spokesperson said the 911 call center only got a couple of reports. I just thought this is ridiculous. We literally had hundreds. An anonymous eyewitness only known as Greg made this statement. I was an Air Force fighter pilot and I served in Vietnam. I flew missions dropping aerial flares and I've been on the ground with flares overhead. Flares cannot stay in perfect formation and travel for miles. They are suspended by parachute. The Phoenix lights flew right over my wife and I that evening. People say, oh, those were flares. They were not flares. That was a slap in the face. Another man, David Parker, says, I was on the I-60. I was driving home from work and I saw this huge V-shaped craft flying towards me. I slammed on the brakes and jumped out of my truck as it came up over me. It was only about 30 feet overhead. I remember thinking I could hit this with a rock. It was gunmetal gray and had thousands of imprints in the surface. It just meandered. This huge craft took up most of the sky. From tip to tip my guess is that it was a mile to a mile and a half wide. The nearest light I could easily see right into. Out of the light poured what looked like lava. It poured down about six feet, then it went back up again. I remember thinking I'm going to get burnt because I was so close. But there was no heat, and no sound I just stood there as it passed by. And then I just started crying. It was overwhelming. It has stuck with me from that day, from that moment. In a 2007 televised interview, Tim Lay says, When I saw that technology, I knew there is nothing on this planet like that. There is no capacity to fly a craft that huge like that. It's not possible. This thing was absolutely perfect. It was so controlled, powerful, smooth and silent. Whoever has this technology is in cahoots with God. Bobby Lay, Tim's wife, says, when it first happened, we were just so awestruck by the whole event. Once we all came back in, we were all talking about it. Then we all just kind of went silent. We were sitting at the table, Tim, Hal, Damien, our grandson, and myself. We didn't even know what to say to each other. We were just sitting there. We were just like, what do we do now? Who do we call? We just didn't know how to process what happened. I mean, this thing we seen, it went right over us. It covered the entire neighborhood. These kinds of witness statements are endless. There are so many accounts that are just baffling. For me personally, reading them I find myself wondering, how could this number of people be mistaken? So many different people saying the same thing. Respected investigators have estimated as many as 20,000 witnesses. I knew about the Phoenix Lights before doing research for this story, but I did not realize the magnitude of it. Not only is there so much evidence, but the way the Air Force handled things just makes me wonder. What does it all mean? And will we ever know what this thing truly was? I hope one day we will get answers. Not just for me, but for everyone. Especially the staggering number of witnesses. They have faced ridicule for so many years. 
I think we all deserve to know the truth. As we ponder the enigmatic events of the Phoenix Lights, we are confronted with questions that transcend our reality. Could these lights have been a glimpse of something beyond our comprehension? Visitors from distant realms? The Phoenix Lights remind us of our place in the universe, a tiny blue dot amidst a vast cosmic ocean. Perhaps in our pursuit of understanding, we find ourselves facing not only the mysteries above, but also those within. Whether we are alone in the universe or sharing it with beings from far off worlds, these events challenge us to embrace curiosity, to explore the unknown, and to forever seek the truths that lie beyond. I want to thank you for listening. I hope this story was eye-opening and shed some light on some of the stranger things that happen in this world. I plan to have a new story out every couple of weeks, so if you enjoyed this one, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss any. Additionally, I would encourage anyone that has had an experience of their own to submit them in the comments, only if you feel comfortable doing so. Anyone should be able to talk about an experience without the stigma we have seen in the past. Until next time, good night.